Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Wenger. I'm the tech team specialist here at OUUC. Just like to welcome you all this wonderful Sunday. And uh, just a reminder, uh, all cell phones be off or silent. And we are recording this via Zoom. And we welcome everyone who is attending remotely on Zoom today. And we hopefully to have a wonderful service. Thank you. Let's sing together our morning song. It's hymn number 188 out of the gray hymnal, Come, Come, Whoever Thou Are. If you're online, you can find the lyrics posted in the chat. And it's not printed in the hymnal, but we're going to um, put the original lyric back in of, Though you've broken your vow a thousand times. And we'll sing it twice before we go into singing, Come, Come, Whoever Thou Art. All right. I invite you to rise in body and our spirit, and let's sing together. Take a breath. Though you've broken your vow a thousand times, though you've broken your vow a thousand times, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come. One more time. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover Ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come. Come yet again, come. Thank you for singing. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the Olympia Unitarian Universalist Congregation Worship Service. We're so glad that you're here. We are a democratic congregation, united by the covenant we have created. We envision a healthy and peaceful world where justice prevails. We strive to live out our mission to welcome and wonder, embrace and empower, bridge and become, and I forgot to take my mask off. <laughs> Everyone is welcome here, and we thank all of you for choosing to worship with us this morning. Children of all ages are welcome here in the sanctuary with us, and there is also nursery care and story time for children just down the hallway in the classroom wing. It is up to each family how they would like to participate. We are a multi-general community and we value our young ones. My name is Ann Radford and I am a member of the worship arts team. Leading worship with me today is Elizabeth Micah Gashir. Elizabeth is a descendant of Dutch Protestant Christian working class immigrants who were mostly farmers. She is an aspirant UU minister and chaplain whose sponsoring congregation is the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. Elizabeth is completing her year-long chaplain residency at St. Peter Hospital this month and is seeking work as a full-time chaplain in the area. Also leading worship with me today are Troy Fisher, our music director, and Sarah Lewis, our Director of Community and Faith Development. We're grateful for the many hands that have helped make worship happen this morning. Thank you to the ushers and greeters, the kitchen crew, and the tech members who all contribute in many ways. After the service, for those online, we invite you to into a breakout room for a virtual coffee chat. 
this is a chance to gather with a small group, say hello, and check in. For those in person, please feel free to stay for coffee and conversation in the Commons. Here are a couple of events coming up at OUUC. This afternoon, the Earth Ministry will hold their Harvest Hoopla event at OUUC. This is a time to build communities, celebrate, and support our collective sacred environmental justice work. Join us from 3 to 4.30 on the patio of the Commons. Everyone is welcome. Now mark your calendar for the OUUC picnic on Saturday, August 27th from 2 to 7 at Miller Sylvania Park. We're counting on a big turnout. We hope to see you there. There are many opportunities to stay connected to our community. Please check the website regularly, and if you have questions or need help, please check in with a staff member. Now, let us open our hearts and minds as we prepare for worship. Welcome, everyone. It is good to be together. every Sunday morning we join Unitarian Universalist congregations around the country in lighting a chalice, the symbol of our faith tradition. Please join me as we light our chalices together with these words by Tara Humphreys. Whether you are from the South, the East, the North, or the West, whether you were born into this faith, found it, or it found you, whether you feel at home or are still trying to find your place. Whether you believe in God, are open to mystery, or still have no idea. Whether you are employed, unemployed, underemployed, cobbling things together, overworking, or in school. Whether you are holding anxiety, grief, confusion, anger, hope, restlessness, or deep peace. Unitarian Universalist has a place for you. It is right here. And this chalice is lit for you. Good morning. Let's do that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Now I know you're awake. Our opening words are offered by the Reverend Rachel Small Stokes. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and who saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints, as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the AIDS quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud, and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love. And so, beloved, let us love one another. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. Come, let us worship together. Let's sing together again. Hymn number 1064 out of the Teal Hymn Book, Blue Boat Home. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit. And let's sing together. If you're online joining us, you can find the lyrics posted in the chat. <laughs> Standing on a 
mountain and plain, far away from the rolling ocean, still my dry land heart can say, I've been sailing all my lifetime, never a harbor or port have I known, the wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat home. The sun my sail and moon my rudder, as I ply the starry sea. My ship's companions, all we kindred pilgrim souls, making our way by the lights of the heavens in our beautiful blue boat. Or port have I known? The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat. Home. Thank you for singing. Good morning. The story that I have to share with you today is called The Hidden Treasure of Lvov. It's a traditional Jewish wisdom story as recorded and brought to us by author Kenneth Collier. Once there was a rabbi named Shmuel who although was very pious, good, kind, wonderful, was also very, very poor. Why? He would barely scrape by with life's necessities to the extent where he sometimes had to ask for the generosity of others just to pay his taxes. He lived in a small village just outside the town of Lvov in Ukraine. And then one night, he had a dream. In his dream, he saw a specific bridge in the city of Vienna. And the bridge was so vivid in the dream, he saw all the details of exactly how it looked. And then he saw a person burying something under the bridge, a treasure. And he heard a voice that said that if he went to Vienna and dug up the treasure, it would be his. Well, Shmuel was troubled by this because after all, if somebody else planted the treasure, it was their treasure and, and even if he went and dug it up and found it, it still wouldn't be his to just take the treasure. So he consulted with some other rabbis and they all gave the same advice that because in the dream the voice had said the treasure would be his, that it was still right and good that he should go seek the treasure. Now it's a really long journey from Lvov to Vienna. And Shmuel was very poor, so he couldn't even afford like a donkey or a horse, much less like carriage fare. So he had to walk the entire way, which he did. He walked, sleeping in haystacks and begging for food along the way, so that by the time he arrived in Vienna, he was even more ragged and battered and poor looking than he had been when he set off from home. But he found the bridge. It was definitely the same bridge from his dream except 
that there were guards posted at the bridge. Well, he couldn't just go digging up a treasure right in front of the imperial guards. He wasn't sure what to do, so he lingered and waited and paced back and forth. And actually, he stayed there doing that for a couple days until one of the guards who had been watching this ragged, poor rabbi walk back and forth near the bridge approached him and said, it seems like you're looking for something. Can I help you? Are you waiting for someone or something? And Shmuel said, oh no, I, I came all the way from far, far away because I had a dream that buried under this bridge there was a treasure and that I was meant to dig it up. At that, the guard laughed and said, oh, that's crazy to come all that way because of a dream. Why, dreams. If I believed in my dreams, I would have gone long ago to this little village outside of Lavaf because I had a dream that there was a hut there that was owned by a man named Shmuel, and if I went there and dug up his floor, I would find a treasure. But when I woke up the next morning, I thought, that is ridiculous. And so, of course, I didn't do it. At that, Shmuel knew what he needed to do, and he made the long journey again by foot all the way back home. It was many days, and he arrived even more ragged and dirty and tired, but immediately he began digging up the floor in his hut, and sure enough, there was his treasure. Thus ends our story. We came together in community this morning, bringing all that is in our lives. In this space, we share from our hearts what brings us joy and sorrow, what brings us worry and delight, what makes us afraid and what makes us dance. I did it again. Let's open our hearts to the complexity of life as we place stones into the water of community. If you would like to send something in to share, please look for the link on the online worship page on the OUUC website, and we'll bring it into the service next week. Right now, I invite you to take a breath. As we open our hearts to the complexity of all that is in our lives and community. Gail Reedy mourns the death of her cousin Steve Stilson, who died this morning of cancer. Wendy Tanner shares that her friend Stephanie Condon suffered a debilitating stroke on August 11th. Stephanie's family will need an outpouring of love and support from the Olympia community over the next several months as Stephanie recovers. She is currently in the critical care unit at St. Peter Hospital. 
Wendy asks that we keep Stephanie and her husband Tom and her children Sam and Lily in our hearts during this heartbreaking journey. Wendy, we send you love and care. We send it to Stephanie and her family this day and for the months to come. For those online, I invite you to share from your heart by entering in the chat on your screen. This is a time to share all that you wish, joys and sorrows, and whatever else is shared from your heart. For those in person today, I invite you to come forward if there is something you would like to bring into the community. Take a stone, place it into the water, as you hold your sharing in your heart. Please come up the center aisle and go back this way. We place a stone in the water for all that has been shared from our hearts. We will place one more stone in the water for all that we hold in our hearts and that remain unspoken. I invite you now into a time of prayer and reflection and meditation. Spirit of life and love, we thank you for this time to be together. We are grateful and yet we hold a lot, both spoken and unspoken in our hearts. We are grateful that we are able to bear these joys and sorrows in community, and to have this tangible reminder that we are never alone. We breathe in love and we breathe out fear. We breathe in grace and we breathe out doubt. We breathe in life and we breathe out loneliness. With this breath, may it be so. Amen. seated and sing together hymn number 15 out of the gray hymnal the lone wild bird if you're joining us online the lyrics will be posted in the chat 
express our gratitude by joining together in service to our community and to something greater than ourselves. Our prayers and meditations deepen our gratitude for what we know is sacred in our lives and in the world. The offering collected here today does two things. It supports the ongoing work of OUUC, which is also supported by your regular pledges. This offering also supports an organization that serves our community in harmony with our Unitarian Universalist values. This month, our Share the Plate recipient is Safe Place. Safe Place strives to stop sexual and domestic violence and advocate for personal and societal change through crisis intervention and education. For 40 years, Safe Place has provided crucial services for survivors and their children. Please note that you can participate in the offering by making a donation online through the church website or by texting the number that will appear on your screen in just a moment. You can also mail a check to OUUC or place your offering in one of the baskets being passed. Our community partners continue to need our financial support. May the offering now be generously given as it is gratefully received.
thank you for your generous gifts. And thank you, Troy, for always reminding us that music changes us on a cellular level. Today's readings are from the Christian Bible. First, from Genesis chapter 1, verses 20b through 32. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had, God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Our second reading comes from John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. I remember one of the distinct moments when I felt I had found my spiritual home in Unitarian Universalism. I was a ministerial intern at my home congregation of First UU Nashville under Reverend Gail Seavey's supervision during my second year at Vanderbilt Divinity School in 2019 to 2020. Reverend Gail had invited me to attend the Worship Planning Committee's monthly meeting as part of my education. So we were all seated in a circle around a large table there in the fireside room, as it was called, and this was pre-pandemic times. And the team was discussing the upcoming monthly worship themes, one of which was God. One of the worship associates immediately, directly, and rather casually, initiated a conversation about the benefits and challenges of using the word God in our congregation. Others chimed in, including the minister, and suddenly we were in a full-fledged discussion about whether or not to use God language in church, with voices noting how it might bring up some traumatic feelings for others, while for some people it might feel accessible. I remember one woman in particular, Carol, who was sort of a southern belle with curly brown hair, who shared how she was raised Southern Baptist and how the word God for her was really difficult because it reminded her of the fire and brimstone parts of her theological upbringing. How she loved certain parts of her childhood religion and sometimes missed the Bible stories, but how to this day the word God made her feel a little afraid, afraid inside even though she left the Baptist church 20 years ago. I think I can still see Carol sitting at the end of that table so clearly in my mind because at the time I most resonated with her perspective. I remember sitting there in kind of a sense of awe that I got to be at church discussing whether or not and how often and why or why not to use God language in a worship meeting. Does this not strike anyone else as profound? Okay, you're with me, thanks. It was so raw and so honest and felt so true to my own experience. And I remember there sitting, smiling in my heart, feeling full and thinking, wow, I guess I belong here. The work of feminist theologian uh, Mary McClintock Fulkerson explores how theology begins at the site of a wound. She says, like a wound, theological thinking is generated by a sometimes incohate sense that something must be addressed. So if theology, as Merriam-Webster defines it, is the study of religious faith, practice, and experience especially the study of God and of God's relation to the world, then what does it mean when one feels that God is the wound or that religion is the wound? How does a person or a group of people do theology then? Well, in my personal theology and our shared theology, doing theology 
includes and even centers experience. As we put it, UUism is a living tradition that affirms and promotes direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to renew a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. That is one of our six sources, as many of, you, many of you probably know well. So allow me to share some of my experience with all of you this morning as a way of doing theology together. I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church, which is a small Calvinist denomination founded by Dutch immigrants. Our closest Protestant cousins are the Presbyterians, if that offers some context for some of you. My father is and was during my childhood a pastor, and my mother was um, a teacher at the Christian school that we all attended until also entering full-time ministry. So I was a pastor's kid. You might have heard of us. Our reputation precedes us. <laughs> for good or for bad, that's the whole point, right? Well, so I was a very good Christian girl or young woman, involved in Sunday school, choir, taking notes during my dad's sermons, talking to him about it afterward, following the rules of the community about modesty and purity. As a high schooler, I joined the chapel worship planning team and co-founded a girls' Bible study with my best friend because we believed that girls should be able to study the Bible themselves. Outwardly, I was excelling in the role of young Christian woman as I was taught to play it. But inwardly, I was suffering a great deal most of the time. You see, shortly after our family moved from Northern Virginia to Michigan in the middle of my freshman year of high school, I began struggling with my body image and developed gradually and developed an eating disorder that lasted about five years, although it was never diagnosed. Whenever my very concerned parents or aunts would ask me if I was losing weight or not eating enough, I would lie and say I was fine and insist that they left me alone. Patterns of restrictive eating and over-exercising became interspersed with bouts of binging and purging. These were accompanied by cycles of guilt and shame. One of my prayer journal entries from February 12, 2003 reads, Lord, I'm sorry about this body and weight issue. I know it is wrong and I should be content and even proud of what I look like no matter what because you have created me. Yet I struggle with not wanting to lose or gain weight but stay like I am. But then I watch what I eat and feel guilty for eating too much and it shouldn't matter because what is inside matters. But it does, so forgive me of that and my other sins. I believed that if my faith was good enough, I would not be struggling. And this was my ultimate source of shame. This story illuminates how for my young lived Christian reform, this story illuminates my young lived Christian reform beliefs about sin and salvation. As evidenced by my prayer, I conceived of sin as my unhealthy personal choices and lack of contentment. I beseeched God for salvation, which I imagined as deliverance from my bad feelings, my bad feelings. Simply stated, I was taught to believe that Jesus was sent to earth by God to die on the cross as a ransom for my personal sins and other people who were elected personal sins so we could access individual salvation. I often felt pushed and pulled by a theological tension that I could not make sense of no matter how hard I tried. So on the one end of that tension was my belief that I was saved by grace alone. It was a free gift from God. On the other end of that tension was my belief that I was born a sinner innately flawed and completely reliant on great God's grace to do good. The latter manifested in my brain and body as an acute sense that 
I was not good, simply by being human, which translated into a subconscious belief that I was bad unless I was doing good. In other words, it was like existing in a chronic state of shame. Moreover, sometimes it felt like all the doing right and not doing wrong was necessary for my salvation, which was supposed to be free. So this was very confusing. When I got to college and learned about corporate or collective sin, as in societal injustices like white supremacy, patriarchy, heterosexism, colonization, genocide, and how my beloved religion, Christianity, was culpable in these many systems of power and privilege and violence, I was at the very least confused. And moreover, I was hurt, betrayed, devastated, full of grief that I had nowhere to place, which was both toward the church at large and by those who had neglected to teach me this shadow side of our faith, and also toward God. By my sophomore year of college, I declared to my parents and close friends tearfully that I was not a Christian anymore. For anyone who missed it, this sermon is entitled Why I'm a Pagan, excuse me, Why I'm a Christian Pagan Unitarian Universalist. So I feel like you should know that. <laughs> but to be honest, this decision was, in hindsight, more emotionally driven than intellectually driven. At the time, I thought the opposite. It was all about how I wasn't sure that Jesus was the Son of God anymore, so how could I be a Christian? Well, now I know that that's called being a Unitarian. But the truth is that I felt emotionally and spiritually exhausted from trying to climb the pyramid of perfection to become more like God, sitting up here at the top. And I didn't know how to be a Christian without being stuck in cycles of shame and guilt and bodily harm. So I left my faith. And at the time, as I said, this caused me great pain, and I grieved this decision. Sometimes, I still experience that grief and pain. Partly because that was a lot about loss of relationship. I like to say that then community organizing became my church. But into my late 20s of doing a lot of organizing and activism, I had an awakening to the fact that I kept being burnt out, and that might be because I was a spiritual being and didn't have a spirituality. So I was already really active outdoors with friends and nourished by my time in the woods and the water. So at first I came back spiritual, to spirituality through earth-based practices, aka paganism, that friends introduced me to, such as working with an altar, moon rituals, astrology, and tarot. These pagan practices and divine feminine archetypes became a way to heal my body. And then in 2016, I was at uh, Standing Rock, which is where the Dakota Sioux tribe was resisting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Not Dakota Sioux, excuse me, Sioux. And there, just for six days, during that time, I met a Unitarian Universalist minister who happened to be the senior minister at a church in Virginia, which is where I was just about to move to in a week. So when I moved to Virginia from Minnesota, I started going to that church. And that's when I realized during that time, long story short, that I wanted to be a minister. So I, came, I decided to go to divinity school. And in one of my divinity school notebooks, very early on, I wrote the words, I came to heal. It was very clear to me in my heart that I went to divinity school partly to hear, heal my own relationship to Christianity and to God, whatever that meant to me at the time. 
But if you haven't heard, academia is really centered in the head and not so good with the heart stuff. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> So while I think I had many, many healing experiences during my time in graduate school, let's just say that I don't feel that I made that much forward movement in my healing journey. So now that I've been a chaplain for about a year, just over a year, I like to say that divinity school was like the theory part of what religion and faith is all about. And being a chaplain feels like the practice part. Like, do you really believe in love and compassion? Because here's some people for you to show love and compassion to. And they might rub you the wrong way or remind you of your grandmother or who knows what, but you still get this opportunity to practice love and compassion with them. So here's another story of what happened in my experience being a chaplain. I went to visit a patient in pre-surgery, and when I walked in, I said, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm with the spiritual care department. And he said, spiritual, what do you mean? And I completely ignored the skepticism I was experiencing on his face, and his tone, and I just thought, oh, he didn't hear me correctly. So I said, spiritual care department. And he said, I asked for a Christian chaplain to pray with me. Are you a Christian? I said, well, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. And he responded, what does that mean? And the rest of the story you don't even have to know because basically the point is I swallowed my words. He said, can I have a Christian chaplain? I said, I will go get you a Christian chaplain. And I walked out with my tail between my legs, so to speak, to the office and found one of my colleagues and said, this patient needs your service. So in chaplaincy, what you need to know is that we are professionally trained to serve people of all faiths or no faith. So the point is not whether or not he needed a Christian chaplain. If I had had a real visit with him and assessed that he did need someone of his own faith tradition, uh, and I had gotten that chaplain, that would have been a great visit, okay? But the point is that I lost all my own grounding, sense of spiritual authority, and did not even do my job because I became so decentered by the question. And this didn't just happen once, it happened, you know, a handful of times, especially during the beginning of my time as a chaplain. There are still ways, I must admit to you, that I find excuses to disconnect from my patients because of my own stuff, right? I mean, that is lifelong work. But it was shortly after that in class one day that my supervisor said to us, not directly to me, but in a discussion, if you love your patients, you will work on your theology. And as a chaplain, I loved my patients, so I worked on my theology. As I did, I came to recognize that I still deeply, fully, in my body and in my bones, personally experience the divine in the Christ story. In the theology section of the Widening the Circle uh, report, written by the Commission on Institutional Change for the UUA, Reverend Dr. Elias Ortega reminds us that the word religion comes from the same base as the word ligament, something that binds together. He says, to be religious is to be clear about what you are bound to in a way that a ligament holds muscle to the bone. So this year, I have found freedom in embracing that I am bound not only to my Christian heritage and culture, but also to Christian theology and spirituality. I need them 
for my spiritual life to feel complete and full and to make sense. I've decided I'm done compartmentalizing myself, trying to stay in my head at the expense of my heart and my body. I used to say I'm culturally Christian and religiously you, you, and da 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 da. But today, I'm here to tell you, proclaiming my faith in covenantal community, that I am a Christian, pagan, Unitarian Universalist. And so in many ways, this service is a celebration of multi-religious identity. Because I don't expect any of you all to necessarily be a Christian, pagan, Unitarian Universalist. And that is the point. So I'd like to do a little activity. The tech team is prepared to help me with this, with the chat, for those on Zoom. I feel like I should know, it. oh, there's the camera. I can look at you all. So you're invited as I go through these uh, categories of religious identity to raise your hand as you're willing and able if you identify with a particular religious tradition that I state. So if you're on Zoom, you might be able to do this through either if you're on video, just waving, or to uh, raise your hand with that Zoom feature. So, for example, we'll start with an easy one, although there's not going to be any judgment if people don't raise hands, right? <laughs> so, if you identify religiously as a Unitarian Universalist, you're invited to raise your hand. And I want you during this process to like look around the room, check out the chat. Oh, maybe we could put it on the gallery feature. Well, cool. Thanks. Yay. So that we can kind of see who, who we have in our community, all right? Okay, so now if you identify also or separately as Christian, I invite you to raise your hand. If you identify, oh, I wanted to be clear. Let's do that one again. Christian includes Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, or any other form of Christianity. So again, if you identify as Christian. OK, thank you. If you identify as Buddhist, raise your hand. If you identify as Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, raise your hand. Couple. See, I saw two hands on Zoom as well. If you identify as Jewish, raise your hand. If you identify as separately or also, Muslim, raise your hand. What was that last Muslim. Muslim. Thank you. If you identify as humanist, raise your hand. I think I can safely also add that one. And if you identify as another religion that I haven't stated yet, Raise your hand. Would you like to share, to shout it out? Pagan? OK. Part of the complexity for me with that one is um, whether it's a religion or a spirituality. <laughs> yes, because that's the kind of authority we exhibit here. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else who raised their hand just now want to share? Multi-religious, Multi yeah. All right. So some of the good news, which is what the word gospel means after all, of our UU faith is that each of us in our multi-religious identities can belong under this umbrella of Unitarian Universalism. 
And yet I think the shadow side of our very big umbrella is that sometimes we're like me, trying to compartmentalize ourselves or perhaps even hiding parts of ourselves, even from ourselves. Or maybe checking parts of ourselves or our theologies at the door. I wonder how often we say we love and embrace diversity while forgetting that diversity comes from the root word to divide and is in fact much more about difference than it is about sameness. So I'd like to return to our readings from the Christian Bible and to invite you, if you so choose, to experience what these verses have to teach us about ourselves. In the first reading from Genesis, we learn about how Adam, human, has one of his ribs taken out and essentially broken in order to make the other human. I find this to be, and actually I want to just name that I learned this from my supervisor or was reminded of the beautiful theology that is possible here with this story from her, which is that Diversity, making two from one, brokenness, is very painful and also very life-giving. The story is that from brokenness comes relationship. The second text is John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and lived among us. This is basically a sort of summary or testimony of the incarnation. So you see, when I allow myself to be transformed by an experience of God, I can pray a new prayer like this on the overhead intercom at the hospital as a chaplain working on Good Friday. Dear God, Today, this is Good Friday, and we reflect on how Jesus was betrayed by his friends and crucified. We remember that you know what it is like to be human, to suffer, to experience state-sanctioned violence at the hands of other human beings, to die. We take this moment to sit with our own suffering and grief, or with others and theirs, and to remember we are not alone but that you, O oh God, became flesh and are with us in our suffering. Amen. Note how different a theology of incarnation this is. When we compare this prayer with my prayer from high school in the midst of my own suffering from a patriarchal capitalist system that tells me what beauty looks like and what standards I need to live up to, to this prayer, we can see that my prayer as a youth was a prayer about me striving to go up, to reach perfection, to be like God in a way that was just full of shame and guilt. But the other prayer is a prayer that notes how God comes down, that God made God's self a human to know what it was like to suffer, to be betrayed, to be tempted, and to even die. This is what the incarnation teaches me. As Eugene Peterson translates John 1.14 in the message version, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And as Reverend Rachel put it in our opening words, I believe in the church of everyday saints, as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the AIDS quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud, and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. You know, maybe the Holy Trinity has a lot to teach us Unitarians about truly loving diversity and being Christ to one another. But I'll save that for another sermon. 
Let us be together in a moment of silence. join together and sing in our closing hymn, hymn number 20 out of the gray hymnal, Be Thou My Vision. I'm going to take it down a couple notches and we'll let it swing just a little bit. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit and if you're joining us online, you can find the lyrics to the hymn pr um, printed in the chat. breath be thou my vision O God of my heart not be all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my life be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, God. Thou my soul shelter, thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor world's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. Sovereign of heaven, my treasure thou art. We extinguish our chalices with these words by poet Emily Dickinson. In the name of the bee and of the butterfly and of the breeze, amen. May we continue to have our wounds healed by direct experience of that transcending mystery who many call God. And may we continue to pursue what heals. May our healing better equip us to embrace our differences in community. May we experience the divine through knowing and loving each other and in our own religious pursuits. May we go in peace. Let's join together in singing our unison benediction. We are part of the web of life. We are part of the web of love. May our words, may our deeds pull the strands of the infinite web toward health, toward justice, toward love.